Good morning, everybody. Great, great, thank you, and uh, it's an honor being here to talk to you today. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about information and the transformation it has in a digital way across the cities all over the planet. So um, since the time I stepped on this stage, which wasn't that long ago, right? Since the time I stepped on this stage, over two million searches have happened on Google. 48 hours of YouTube videos have been uploaded. Information is rampant in our environment and throughout all of the things that we do every day. And you, as librarians or information professionals, understand this better than anybody to really understand what do we do with this onslaught, this deluge of information. It gives us huge opportunities, but at the same time, huge challenges. And of course, one of those challenges is security. So as I talk today, we'll be talking about this balance between the opportunity that information gives us to help people make better decisions, to transform our communities, to empower people, but also the other side of that, which is how do we make sure that if people are getting information that is appropriate, secure, that they understand the risks of going online and are able to do that in a way that makes it safer for them as well. So I always like to think about life as a story. So I started out as actually working um, in conjunction with our library at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And so I kind of grew up in this environment of wanting to be able to tell stories. And in this case, it was about space. But really, that idea of sharing around a communal aspect. So whether it's sitting around a campfire telling stories, as we still do today, or whether it's really moving to that immersive neural network kind of uh, idea with VR and other technologies that we're getting to today. Somewhere along the line, the way that we change things, the way that we envision our future, the way that we uh, transform our communities is really through the power of storytelling. And what better place to do that than in a library? So when we think about a place like a city, so LA is a big city um, and four million people, 500 square miles, when we think about the city, we really think about what that city could be. And as we think about that, we look at ways that we can envision that with our community. So anybody recognize this? No gamers? <laughs> OK, so my name is Jean. I'm a gamer. Um, <laughs> So this is SimCity. It's one way of envisioning the future of what people think their world could be. So hundreds of thousands of people play the game. Um, they create cities and communities and households that really are their idea of either sort of nirvana or sometimes they you know, create a city that's a little chaotic and crazy. Um, I love sort of the idea of roller coasters in the middle of the city. I think that's a much better way of getting, especially in LA traffic, of getting to the office. Um, but, but one of the things we can learn from gamification and this idea of sort of massive online gaming is what people think about when they think about how they want to envision a city. And it may not be quite like this, but in LA we also, have, so in addition to the gaming industry, um, in LA, we also have Hollywood, right? So Hollywood is part of the city of Los Angeles. And so we have other ideas of what the future might look like. Anyone recognize this one? Blade Runner, yes. So um, I love Philip K. Dick's work, but let's just say that Blade Runner is not maybe the most optimistic future of Los Angeles. But when we think about it, we look at this and we see that there's autonomous vehicles autonomous flying vehicles, which is actually something we're working on in Los Angeles. Um, the idea of sort of where do we cross that line back to the, uh, giving people power through knowledge and then balancing that knowledge with the need for security and privacy. And so here in Blade Runner, we see this onslaught of information, not necessarily empowering information, but advertising that just deluges everybody in the environment. So when we think about planning for the future of our city, when we think about the ability to have digital transformation in our community, we want to understand, one, how people envision the future in a completely unrestricted way, like with SimCity, but we also want to make sure that we understand the future in the ways that we could perhaps have a more dystopian view, because we don't want that kind of <laughs> a view for the future of Los Angeles. So we have at our fingertips these amazing tools to do digital transformation, from artificial intelligence 
to machine learning, looking at robotics and autonomy, the ability to unleash these for the power of helping people stay independent longer in their homes, empowering some of our disabled population to be more independent, for making sure that we're touching all the different languages in the city of Los Angeles. There are 220 languages spoken in my hometown. So our librarians are particularly uh, challenge to make sure that they have materials and capabilities and workshops in all those different languages for all those different cultures. And so as we think about the different kinds of technologies, we really understand that in a city that has a large capability but also a lot of constraints around the budget, how do we unleash these technologies in a way that manifests both for improving city services but also makes a difference to the kids who are living in South LA, the single moms trying to raise a family in Watts, the parents who are trying to raise a family down in Long Beach. So Los Angeles is my hometown. I've lived there uh, my whole life, th third generation, which is kind of rare in a city where it's mostly people who come in um, and, uh, and immigrate. Uh, and so Los Angeles has four million people, 220 languages, 500 square miles, we are one of the most diverse cities on the planet, which is both a blessing and sometimes a challenge. Um, one of the o infrastructure operations I oversee is 311 services. And so we have to be able to provide 311 services to all those different languages, which is a bit of a challenge. So thank goodness for translation services. <laughs> Um, and then the other challenge we have is really understanding that we are also the most impoverished county in the country. So wherever you think that poverty happens, it happens all around us. But in Los Angeles, 25% of our, of our residents are living below the poverty line. And that puts a special opportunity for our libraries to be the place that really connects people to the services for the future, that it gives them that opportunity for education, that really is their first stepping stone into sort of improving the quality of their lives and their status economically. So one of the things I think about when I think about cities and digital transformation is the oldest story I know of digital transformation in a city. So this is a map of London, circa 1834, I think it is. And it's uh, 1854. Uh, and it was created by a physician named Jon Snow. So Game of Thrones fans, it's a different Jon Snow. Um, next year. Not till next year. Um, so Jon Snow was a physician, and there was a massive outbreak of cholera, and they couldn't figure out why. So they were still not really sure about the uh, spread of disease, and what Jon Snow said is, I'm going to understand where people are getting sick and dying. So he simply made a map on the streets of the city of London, and each of those red dots represents death. And when he put that together, he realized that there was a pattern to it. And the pattern uh, at the center of, that, of those uh, deaths is a well, and that well was infected. And so what they found was that cholera was being spread by bad water. And so it was not particularly well understood before that. And this map was the first idea of using geospatial information <laughs> and mapping to create a digital uh, evidence of something that was happening. And with this map, they were then able to close the well help people get access to better water and start to understand the issues that related to um, the sewer systems and water and, and the ability to actually improve health simply by getting information in a way that was usable by lots of other people. So put us to today, we're no longer doing those kinds of maps, but we're doing a ton of other maps. So geospatial information is rampant across the city and we're really using this as part of a smart city initiative. So when we think about smart cities, we want to think about uh, ways not just to like have cool tech. I talk to a lot of people about smart cities, and a lot of folks are like, oh, yeah, well, we're doing AI and machine learning. And I'm like, and, and what, what are you using that for? You know, because it's AI and machine learning. <laughs> you know, we're doing something with blockchain. And, and what are you trying to get out of that? Like, how does that improve life for your citizens? And so what we try to do is we really focus on the benefits that technology can do to help improve the quality of life of people in Los Angeles. So in a city the size of us, we have a ton of sensors around the city and a ton of ways in which we collect data. So when you walk outside today, 
and you look around, you might notice the cameras that you see like on ATM machines, the different kinds of digital devices that are watching you and the public rights of way. But also look up and look on top of the street lights. Look on top of vertical poles that are power poles. Look up on the sides of buildings and you will find that there are devices all over the place. It's a little creepy, <laughs> but it's no creepier than the fact that, well, who here has a smartphone? Really? Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so, <laughs> so that smartphone is watching you right now. You know that, right? We all know that. So it's that balance between digital privacy and digital sort of uh, ability to really do something. So traffic in Los Angeles is really bad. In fact, we're number one in the country. It's not maybe our best number one, but we are number one for traffic congestion. And so there's an application called Waze, which helps you get through the traffic faster. It's really quite good. And so I knew that as soon as I actually downloaded and started using that, um, that I had given up my privacy for my location to a company that I didn't really know what they were going to do with that information, right? They could sell it. They could use it to give me advertising. They could do all kinds of stuff with that. The convenience I got from that was worth it in my opinion. And yet, if I was asked to pay, this, and this was just happening with Facebook, right? If I was asked to pay $5 a month for Waze, maybe I would because it saves me a lot of time. But I don't know that I'd pay five, I wouldn't necessarily pay $50 a month. So at some point, there's this weird uh, dichotomy where you're actually selling off that information and still maybe not getting back that same value to yourself. So as a city, we try not to collect that personal information about people. We have devices in the public rights of ways, but those devices are looking at things like counting the number of pedestrians and bicyclists that are going through different intersections so we can change the signal timing to make it safer for them. We're using computer vision and machine learning in that case, partnering with the Toyota Mobility Foundation to be able to understand the traffic patterns, not just of cars, but of the people who interact all around those cars. Part of what we're doing is next taking that and looking at the profile of people who are in wheelchairs and walkers so we can identify those and be able to give them more time to cross the streets when they are coming to an intersection. So the sensors that we have in place in all of the cities collect all this data. Your smartphones collect data. It's being collected all around you. And we use that to try to improve services in a way that really makes sense. We saw those flying cars in the Blade Runner, Blade Runner picture. So uh, just two weeks ago, autonomous vehicles became legal to operate on the streets of California. So now you can't tell if the car next to you is working autonomous, autonomously, if the driver's just got his hands off and texting, or if that car's actually driving themselves. And so we really are interested in trying to understand the impact that has around safety, around the ability to help people be more independent. Um, we have a large elderly population, and I serve on the board for Aging Into the Future, so a group that looks at how technology can help and support our aging population. And the idea of having autonomous vehicles can be both a little bit disquieting to people, they're concerned about safety, it seems really strange. In Los Angeles, people don't want to give up their cars, that's kind of a status symbol. But when we think about the fact that for many people, that point at which they lose their license, when they get to a certain age and they're just no longer able to drive, then that's often the point at which they lose their independence. And so to be able to say that is no longer the criteria for being independent, that the criteria for being independent as you age is your own desire to stay independent, your own ability to kind of manage your life completely changes that conversation. So while autonomous vehicles get a bad rap from a lot of people, I'm actually a huge advocate for them because I think it really gives people the power to do the things that they want to do in their lives without necessarily feeling that these um, arbitrary decisions of when they can and can't drive are holding them back. And then the trap we always get is that we don't want to get into this idea of having old technology. So Skype, which I love and use every day, is one of those things where when uh, technologies come out, they're fresh, they're bright, they're like a puppy, you know, everybody loves them. And then they get a little bit older and a little bit grumpier, like some older dogs do. I love dogs, by the way. And so suddenly you're like, oh, this isn't that fresh new technology. What we want to do, though, is keep using the technologies that make sense to all of the folks in the city and still be able to think progressively about new technologies and the adoption of those. 
So again, we look at this as a smart city by, and how we're using digital transformation by trying to make sure we're effect, effective and efficient in our city services, but also really making sure that we're equitable. So I earlier talked about how much poverty there is in Los Angeles. And a big challenge for us is to make sure that all of these technologies are able to help improve the quality of life for all people in Los Angeles. So everybody here, practically everybody, I think, had a smartphone, but that's not true for everybody in Los Angeles, right? So some people might have older phones, some people borrow their phones. Um, it's not atypical in many of our neighborhoods. So kids go to school, um, we try to make sure that they have access to new tools and technology. We kind of encourage and ensure that they start using those by having them upload their homework online. They do digital presentations. Um, we have them do research online. But for many of those kids, one kid will be sitting and walking home and have access to you know, a Mac laptop that's their own on a broadband high-speed network at home. And the kid sitting next to them in class is expected to do just the same level of work. But that kid walks home to a house that does not have internet connectivity, doesn't have a computer. He borrows his sister's cell phone to be able to, on an old school cell phone, to write his essay on a cell phone. And then at 11 o'clock at night, walks out into his neighborhood to McDonald's where there's free Wi-Fi and tries to upload it. If he's lucky, the Wi-Fi is still working. And that's the kind of dichotomy that we have when we think about this. Our libraries end up being a central point of resources and services in all of our communities across Los Angeles. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about what some of the programs at the library are. One of the ways that we try to open up more information about the government is by using open data. So like many of you in your cities and your states, uh, we have an open data portal that provides open information about demographics, about the use of technology, about population, about use of our libraries. And so all of this information is available for people and businesses to be able to use to help make uh, better decisions. And we try to be really transparent and accountable for what we do. So we have a controller in the city who's the financial um, advocate for transparency, and he helps to make sure that we show sort of the good and the bad about where we're spending money, how much overtime we're paying our firefighters, um, you know, where we're doing well with housing and economic development, where we're lagging behind. And so it's a great way of using that open data to really hold ourselves accountable to the people who pay our salaries, which is all of the taxpayers. And then we also have services like 311. So do you, is anybody familiar with the 311 service? Great, so 311 is like 911. So you can call it, you can even call it from a cell phone that doesn't have an active service plan, which is an important thing for us um, because not everybody can afford uh, to actually have the same kind of plan we kind of all have gotten used to. Uh, so 311 is a city service. It's available on the web, on a mobile application, and via call center. So you, whatever uh, kind of situation you find yourself in, you can do this. And you can call and ask any question. Okay, probably not the questions you normally get at the libraries, <laughs> but questions like, you know, who represents me? Um, there's a mattress out in the alleyway. I want to get it picked up. Um, somebody painted graffiti on this building. There's something broken in the city. Um, and so we get about 2.1 million calls a year at the 311 call center. And that's, well, in a big city with 4 million people, <laughs> it happens. And so this is a great way for us to be responsive. So rather than just stuff sort of accumulating in the environment, then we're able to actually have all of our citizens empowered to fix the things that they see and that bug them. And we generally try to have 24 or 48 hour response. So in 24 hours, we will remove graffiti if it's, if it's reported. And we check it against an art database, by the way. <laughs> so we have a community art database. Some one person's graffiti is another person's art. <laughs> So if it's actually public art that's been put up there or something that somebody has tagged as art for the community, um, just because a person visiting that community somewhere else thinks of it as graffiti, we don't overwrite it. Um, and then we also, uh, in 48 hours, try to deal with bigger issues like potholes and other sorts of things. So we do try to be super responsive to the people who call. And again, we publish this data in real time on our open data portal. So anybody else can also say, oh, has anyone reported that pothole in our neighborhood? Um, you know, how fast are you responding? And we're, again, held accountable. One of the other interesting things that we're doing is around disaster management. So you might have heard we recently had some wildfires in the city. 
And so um, we talk about the force. You guys have seasons back here, right? <laughs> so uh, it's like there's stuff called rain outside <laughs> from California. That's very interesting. Uh, so we have, we have four seasons, too. We have fire, flood, earthquake, and drought. Um, so fire season happens on a pretty regular basis. It's just kind of the nature of nature in California. Um, but one of the things we do is we use that open data, and we also use data from data.gov to be able to look at where vulnerable populations are in a wildfire situation. So we can reach out to nursing homes, we can reach out to um, areas where there are daycares, um, areas where we know that citizens have uh, expressed interest in getting help so that our first responders can get out to them first and make sure that they can get evacuated. Um, in a city like Los Angeles, it also means understanding where our homeless encampments are because we do have a lot of homeless folks in Los Angeles. One of the seasons I mentioned is earthquakes. So earthquakes, uh, if you've grown up in California, we, we think it's actually probably the easier thing to deal with. I have, my best friend lives in Florida, and like three times a, a year during hurricane season, she's like calling me and she goes, we're down in the basement, we're hunkered down. I'm like, this happened, like the last time we had a big earthquake was 1994. So I'm okay with the fact that we have these earthquakes periodically. What's frightening about earthquakes, what's dis disquieting about earthquakes is you don't know when they're gonna happen. Right? At least with hurricanes and other weather phenomena, you have some sense of warning. But working with the US Geological Survey, we're able to change that. <clears throat> so the USGS has put ground sensors up and down the western coast. And so from Baja, Mexico, all the way up into Bellingham, we have uh, thousands of sensors in the ground. And as an earthquake starts along a fault, it starts to shake, right? And those ground waves travel slower than we are able to get a radio wave to be transmitted. And so what we're able to do is actually give people one to two minutes warning that an earthquake is coming. So Jane, if my phone goes off right now, just like duck and cover, okay? <laughs> um, so we actually have this out in a pilot right now. And we'll be rolling it out to all city employees in June and then to all four million Angelinos by the end of the year. <clears throat> so this will be available for anybody to be able to understand that there's an earthquake coming and really takes that whole idea of sort of uncertainty and fright out of the equation. And so it'll notify you to duck and cover. What's interesting though is because it's an electronic signal, right, it's digital, we're able to do other stuff with it. So it's not just pushing it through to your mobile application, but we can also push notifications out to any cell phone that's in the region. So even if you don't have the app, we will be working on those notifications with the telecommunication providers to force it out to people so that everybody in the geographic location is able to get that uh, notification. And in addition, because it's digital service, we're able to get that out to other machine um, supported services across the city. So we have the busiest port in the country. 40% of all imports to the United States actually come through the port of Los Angeles, which was mind boggling to me. <laughs> But the uh, Port of Los Angeles is very busy, and we have a whole section of the port that's just all autonomous. So there are no humans in this section of the port. Every, the ships come in, all the cranes are autonomous, it lifts it out onto rail that's autonomous, onto trucks that are autonomous. It's a pretty amazing uh, system. But what we want to be able to do is lift all those cranes when an earthquake's coming so that the ships don't get trapped in, in port. We want to be able to open the firehouse doors so that the fire trucks can get out if the building's damaged. We want to be able to put out public announcement services over our all of the LA Unified School Districts so the students know to duck and cover. So these are the kinds of things that save lives, that make a huge difference, and make it so that we're able to respond as a city more quickly during an emergency. And of course, again, my favorite, autonomous vehicles. And I love autonomous vehicles, not because of you know, all of the cool tech in it, that's interesting, but it's the idea of being able to have independence, the idea of the fact that for a lot of our millennials, they're less interested in owning a car. I mean, I, when I was 16, I was pounding on my 16th birthday on the DMV to like get my license. I have three adult children and none of them were interested. <laughs> so. They all have their licenses now, but it, it's just not quite the same thing. A lot of the young people who work for me at the city 
don't even own cars. In a city like Los Angeles, they choose to bike, take public transit. It's just an expense that's not part of their value chain anymore. And so autonomous vehicles gives us that ability to move people around without forcing them to make that choice or have the economic uh, stability to be able to own a car. So it's really an equalizer in many ways. The other interesting thing about autonomous vehicles is that they are 95% more safe for pedestrians, for other vehicles, for bicyclists. So in our city, about 260 people die in traffic accidents every year, which is a frightening number. And what we want to do is get that to zero. We have something called Vision Zero. As with autonomous vehicles, we will be able to bring that number significantly down to maybe 13 people a year. And because we've all done it, you get distracted while you're driving. Whether you're a texter or not, the idea is that you just sometimes space out, you sometimes get caught up in a conversation, you see something in the landscape. That distraction isn't an issue for autonomous vehicles. The interesting part about autonomous vehicles, too, is that we don't have to think two-dimensionally. We think about autonomous vehicles being on the ground. But just like in Blade Runner, they're actually being lifted up. So Uber, for example, has a program called Uber Elevate that we're talking with them about. And this is actually three dimensions. So think about autonomous flying taxis. And so the idea is that when you have gridlock on the ground, and you guys have it here in DC too, to be able to bring a lot of that cargo and people up into the air and move it quicker to wherever you need to go. And again, with the work that the FAA has done, uh, autonomy in the air can be just as safe as autonomy on the ground. The other thing we're doing is making sure that in a city where we have a huge number of uh, individuals and we have all this traffic going on, that we are really able to support the idea of what the impact of all of that is on climate. So whatever the federal government has decided, we've actually um, organized 402 mayors across the country and uh, into Canada to uphold the Paris Climate Accords. And so Mayor Garcetti is the leader of this program. And what that does is it really makes sure that cities where a lot of industry happens and where a lot of traffic is and where a lot of people um, live and a growing number of people um, are moving again back towards cities is that we're really able to do local regulation to ensure that we keep the greenhouse gas emissions down and that we really work towards having a healthier and safer planet. This is a picture um, of how it was when I grew up in Los Angeles. <laughs> so I, uh, I, like many people in Los Angeles, suffer from uh, lung issues. I have bronchitis all the time. And so this is what it was like. You know, you grew up and you can't even see the city. We would have, you, you've all had snow days? We had smog days, no, seriously. So <laughs> they would, um, you would be notified that it was too unhealthy to breathe. And so they didn't want kids walking to school, exercising at school, going on the playground, and so school would be canceled because of smog. Um, we've done a huge amount of regulations and changes, enforcement, um, gas tax. If you've ever been to California and driven, gas is, is a lot more expensive because we have a ton of additives to the gas to make sure that there's less pollution from cars. And so we end up with a city that's much, much cleaner, but a city that's still challenged with um, air quality and air pollution. Uh, it's just it's a lot, in a lot better sense. And so the idea of having this coalition of climate mayors is really important so that we continue our progress and don't sort of come back to the way things have been in the past. One of the other things that we're really interested in working with and that we started um, supporting is the idea of artificial agents, intelligent agents. So are any of you guys using, uh, anyone have Amazon Alexa in their house? You guys are braver than I am. Okay, so I love technology, <laughs> but always listening device, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I get the allure of it. Um, so the ability to just say, you know, Alexa, play my favorite music. Alexa, you know, help me make sure I don't forget to do this thing. Uh, we find that it's a very empowering kind of device for people. If you have it and you've gotten used to it, you really love it because it just makes things so much easier. And again, when we think about our aging population, devices like chatbots and, um, and artificial uh, agents are really empowering. So that uh, to the extent that people start to sort of personify them. So we were, had this conference recently for Aging into the Future. 
and I was sitting with a group of seniors uh, at a lunch table and we were talking and one of them said something that was uh, very interesting which was Alexa is my new best friend which was both intriguing and disquieting at the same time um, because I could totally understand why they felt that that presence was in their lives and helping them to be independent and helping them to do things in an easier way but at the same time, we have to balance this idea of sort of artificial intelligence with human touch, right? So how do we make sure that as we're moving city services, we're the first city to put services on Alexa, that we're also making sure that we don't use that in, um, in the absence of uh, human services. So when you come to LA or if you're uh, an Alexa user, you can say, hey, Alexa, what's going on in the city of Los Angeles? And they'll talk about all the cool cultural events going on this weekend. And uh, we have Ciclavia on Sunday, which is super fun. Uh, Ciclavia is where they close 10 miles of city streets and make it just for pedestrians, bicyclists, skateboarders, skaters, um, which is super fun. We do that every two months. Um, or you can say the other one of the other services we have, which is like my, my least favorite service, which is Alexa, how do I pay my parking ticket? Um, but we can, you can have Alexa help you with all kinds of things. And down here is the newly christened Officer Chip. So he was just made a member of the LA Police Department. Chip is our city hall internet personality, but he's a chatbot. Uh, so Chip is available on a ton of our city websites on 311. And what it does is it just helps people, again, in a different way, using 117 different languages, be able to sort of interact through texting, and, uh, and typing the ability to get lots of answers to city services. So again, we kind of think about, there's people who are gonna call up 311, um, and there's also people who just kind of wanna get a quick answer and, and use an interface like CHIP. And so we try to use these different kinds of services. Now as we think about all these services, again, we have to think about this idea of the digital divide. So in a city that I love, we find that we are having huge poverty issues. 30,000 people sleep unsheltered every night on the streets of Los Angeles. Now, on Monday, the mayor gave his State of the City address, uh, and in that, we pledged $430 million this year alone to building supportive housing for the homeless. So we have focused very heavily in the last year and are continuing to double down on that focus to work with our homeless populations to make sure that everybody has a place to call home. Um, but one of the other issues we have is in this growing need to be digitally connected, to have access to these kinds of services, to really understand the information and how it can empower us to make better decisions, we find that people are getting more and more digitally divided. So this map on the chart shows you uh, the connections of people, the number of at-home connections to the internet. So areas that are yellow are areas that are less connected, and areas that are purple are areas that are more connected. And if you laid a socioeconomic map over this uh, one, you would find these are very highly connected. So those yellow areas kind of right in the center are areas called Watts and South LA, two of our most impoverished communities. And it's not like we're having connectivity and it's slowly increasing, it's actually decreasing in those neighborhoods. So over time, it, people are finding it less and less affordable to have internet connectivity at home. So just think about that. Think about all the things we do online, all the things we're expected to do online. You know, being able to make doctor's appointments, apply for a driver's license, um, schedule all payments. That those folks who don't have connectivity at home are hampered by that. Libraries are an important part of trying to make that connection happen. But when you don't have connectivity at home and you're looking for a job, it, the studies have shown that if you have that connectivity, you will find a job seven weeks faster for $5,000 more a year. So having that ability to easily respond to emails, to be online, to get training, to get support, to have a good resume that's up to date, all of that happens because you're connected. So the variance here is in those poor communities, it's 58% and dropping for the number of households that are connected at home. And the better areas, it's 97% and climbing. So although we'll always have a few people who choose for whatever reason not to be connected at home, we want to make sure that this digital divide changes the whole concept and we start talking about digital inclusion. And our libraries are really at the heart of that. So we think about connectivity, access, and literacy to be part of the digital community. 
And that connectivity is making sure that people have the ability to connect, like there's some connectivity in their neighborhood. There are places in the country, particularly in rural America, where there just isn't a provider. And so now what we're doing is we're working with public-private partnerships with all of the telecommunication companies. To tell you the truth, I never thought I would become such fast friends <laughs> with all of the big telecommunications companies. But they are really a huge part of our strategy to try to get more people connected and to have more provider choices to people. So we don't want it just to be like, there's a provider, provide, AT&T provides uh, access in one community. We want to make sure that there's competition in that community so that we have really affordable options for people. And then we have lots of different options for people. Um, so that's an important part of our strategy. It's not just to build it as, a, as our own city and like lift up all of that infrastructure ourselves, but to really share that map I just showed you with all of those providers and say, we'll be happy to help you put your 5G small cell devices on all of the street lights that you need so that you can develop this new network architecture. But to do that, you have to build out in these digitally excluded neighborhoods. And so we want to make sure that the new map is purple everywhere. The other thing we do is we want to make sure that people have access. So we talked about the poor kid who's borrowing his sister's cell phone to do his essay. A lot of people do not have computers at home. A lot of people have very little access to computers. And so we actually do a computer giveaway program. So we take old city computers. We teach the kids in the neighborhoods how to update the hardware and software. We teach them cybersecurity skills so they can wipe the hard drives. And then what we do is we bundle those up with a four-year Wi-Fi hotspot and we give them away. It's the best thing. I love doing our cycle. It's called Our Cycle LA. It's like the highlight of my week every week. Uh, and so we do this to, uh, we just did one for a senior citizen home in Koreatown. So we actually did that in Korean. So I think it went well, but um, I don't speak Korean. Uh, and then we did one for young mothers who had dropped out of high school because they had gotten pregnant and had chosen to have children. And then they were coming back to high school to finish their high school uh, degree. And so we gave them computers, uh, all kinds of programs. Uh, we have a, a second chance job fair, which is for people coming out of prison who've turned their lives around and want to get started. And so we have employers in the neighborhoods who are interested in helping those people. And we can do computer giveaways there too. Um, there's a group called Homeboy Industries, started by this amazing um, Catholic priest who works with really the most difficult sort of gang members in South LA and Watts, the Bloods and the Crips and some of those gangs, and really transforms their lives as they're either just about to go kind of on the verge of getting into trouble um, or just coming out of prison. And uh, he's, he bought this bakery because it was cheap and available. And now we have Homeboy Industries, which has cafes all over the city. We just gave, uh, did a computer giveaway to the Homeboy cafes um, around City Hall. And then um, the third part is really an amazing program by our libraries, which is to make sure that people have digital literacy. So it's training programs. We have um, uh, Welcome to LA, which is an immigration support program for people who are immigrating. We have all sorts of great uh, training spaces. But um, one of the great programs we do is called Tech2Go. So you can go and you can check out a copy of The Hunger Games, but you can also check out a month of the internet. So we check out the Wi-Fi hotspots. I know some of your libraries are probably doing that too. Super great program, really empowering. And we think about, well, what's a month of the internet going to do? But what if you're a high school junior looking to see whether or not you could actually get to college? What if you're somebody who's trying to apply for a job? What if you need to get online training in order to be able to qualify for a promotion at work? and you are living in those communities that have 50% internet access at home, suddenly that ability to check out a Wi-Fi hotspot is transformational. And so I think it's just a really great way for libraries to be part of the digital inclusion aspects. This is my favorite program at the library. So uh, what we do is on the first day of kindergarten, every LAUSD school uh, st student gets a library card. So this is your passport to the future. Um, I'm sure that many of you have great memories of libraries. I know that when I was a kid, sitting crisscross applesauce on the library rug while being read to, and before I was able to actually start my own journey into reading, was like just the most amazing, mind-blowing opportunity, I thought. It made me fall in love with books and made me fall in love with learning. And, and the libraries where I grew up were just so transformational, as they are for so many children. 
And so if we are working with kids whose parents are immigrants who maybe don't understand the power of libraries to do that transformation, or people whose parents are really busy, or people who are foster kids, right? So there's just, they don't understand the ability for libraries to be there and that it's a free service. Being able to say on your first day of school, this is your passport into learning, that you have it not just at school but in your neighborhood, is really important. And so as part of the library services, we make sure that every kid understands the power. And uh, our mayor has a five-year-old daughter. And so he said that the best thing, she, she's so proud, she carries her library card around with her all the time. She's like, I'm Maya Garcetti. <laughs> So she feels like it's, it's her, uh, her, her identification. The other super cool uh, program, and I know a lot of you guys are doing these too, is we have a program called LA Makerspaces. So we partner with a nonprofit who brings in the ability to really um, tell kids and adults, we find a lot of times um, young uh, kids bring in their grandparents for these programs. And, uh, and so we teach them robotics, tech, we do Raspberry Pi, we teach, do the ArtBot program. And so this is a really great chance to demystify science and engineering in a way that's super hands-on. And we can touch kids at the earliest possible time to really bring them into STEM careers. And so the, going to the makerspace uh, fairs, we've had uh, 15,000 kids go through the program. 781 uh, workshops have been held at 37 different public libraries in LA. So it's, it's really a great program. And now they have persistent spaces at many of those libraries. So there's always a th something happening at the makerspace. And again, part of our challenge with dealing with all this digital inclusion is making sure that we understand the commitment we have as a city to the four million residents of Los Angeles. So up here, you see a picture of Herb Wesson, who's our council president, at an R-Cycle LA giveaway event. And so he has been a very uh, generous sponsor of this to help pay the kids a salary who are doing these giveaway programs and make sure that all of the computers also have a full year of support services. Because the first time you get a computer, OK, so like, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a technologist. And I've sometimes had to call like the geek squad. <laughs> Because that first year, you're not quite sure, and what does this mean, and is doing an update, and so we want to make sure that they have a year of free service to be able to help them be successful in the use of that. We also have a program um, called Find Your Future, and so this is for disconnected youth, 16 to 24-year-olds who aren't working and aren't in school, and this lets them find a career, sometimes in a completely different way. And we use a combination of sort of gamification and ontologies, actually, to be able to ask them really cool questions like, what do you think about looking at the stars? I like it, I love it. What do you think about you know, helping somebody organize their house? I like it, I love it. And so those actually track in the background to a whole ontology to the Department of Labor classifications so that we can actually work with organizations like JobCase to be able to pull out jobs that are available for these kids with very little experience and to get them started on not just a job but a career track that's close to their house, accessible, and with a company that understands that these are kids who maybe are coming from a different kind of background, not sort of like coming from one job to another. And then we work with our Chamber of Commerce to make sure that they're work ready and we go through some training programs. So that's been a really interesting use of of tech to be able to help kids think differently about their future. Um, and then the other thing that was just announced, so we, for the last year we've been doing a program called the LA College Promise because we realized that for a lot of kids, college was just never in the cards, right? So they grew up poor, they thought they'd just have to start working. So even if we, we commit to saying, no, 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 it's totally affordable, kids just don't have that perception. So Mayor Garcetti decided that he wanted to tell kids that he has faith in them, that every graduating senior from LA Unified School District, 650,000 kids are in LA Unified School District, so it's a lot of people, that every graduating senior, he wanted last year to have a promise that he would pay for, well, we would pay, <laughs> for one free year of college. So starting last year, those students went to the first free year of community college, and just on Monday he announced that they are now extending the program. It's been so successful. It increased enrollment at our community colleges by 40 percent. 40 percent. And we're the largest community college school district, community college district in the country. It was huge. It was super successful. So this year we have extended it to two years. 
So with two years of free community college, that means you can get your AA degree. And in those two years, you can figure out, how am I going to get scholarships? How can I get now apply with the two-year program? We have an a easy entry into UCLA and UC Irvine and all of the University of California school districts, as well as the Cal State University district. So with that two-year degree, your life can be transformed, and it no longer costs you a penny. And that kind of change, that kind of uh, trust, that kind of belief in people is really transformational. Now, part of what we're trying to do is create citizen scientists. So, so like this, like Doc Brown, um, or citizen scientists like this. Um, so these are kids playing our Discovery of Agents game, which is in 12 city parks right now and in City Hall. And we're about to launch the Agents of Climate Change. Uh, so what it is, it's an augmented reality smartphone uh, game. And if you don't have a smartphone and you go to the, the park, you can check out a smartphone so you can play the game so anybody can play. Um, and as you go through, you're learning about the creatures in the park, the different kinds of trees. You're trying to capture squirrels or cougar or different kinds of mountain lion. We have bear in Los Angeles. You probably didn't know that. Um, we have a very, very diverse um, ecosystem. And so as they go through, they're learning, they're playing, they're finding out in City Hall. They don't catch cougars in City Hall. They actually find out what's behind that door. <laughs> So what does the controller do? What does the mayor do? Um, you know, try to find where the money goes. Uh, so we have these different kinds of games. And what they do then is they actually earn real world badges. So they get these badges um, at the parks then if they've completed so many missions. So it's a really great way to get kids to really engage with technology and to start to understand. But one of the other things we get out of this is with the agents of climate we're about to release is that kids are actually going to start adding data. So we're going to create citizen scientists. So we're asking them to take temperature readings. We're going to ask them to work on air quality. And so that actually we'll be getting science badges as well. And part of this is actually based on some work that a lot of um, you might have been involved with, with the Federal Citizen Science um, Toolkit. So this is a great toolkit if you're interested in doing citizen science programs. Uh, it's uh, put out through the um, General Services Administration and looks at how we can pull data from citizen projects and integrate that in a way that scientists also will use. So it actually really connects into science programs at NASA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Science Foundation, NOAA, EPA. So all of those um, have uh, signed up to agree to be able to then use the citizen scientists science data that comes out. And it's part of what we're really trying to do is build this whole ecosystem of folks who together are going to transform Los Angeles into the future. And part of that is understanding that we need to help people get this access to education and digital literacy. We need to help them get access to be able to do the same kind of digital transformation we're trying to do at City Hall in their homes and in their communities. One of the groups we work with is a portion of Code for America. So our local brigade is called Hack for LA. We are the most active hacktivists in the country. Uh, we meet three times a week, which is insane. Uh, and so because it's a big city, we meet in different neighborhoods. So downtown, on the west side, by the beach. And now we're just starting a new one in South LA, which is one of those impoverished communities. So it's really great to have very diverse groups that come together. And so each week, we get together and we work on civic tech ideas. These are not city employees, although we always make sure that somebody from the city and the county is there to answer questions and support. But these are just amazing groups of people who are volunteering, who want to make a difference. We work on food desert issues, so we created a food oasis looking at where you can get fresh food throughout the city. There's uh, issues around um, parking. We have really confusing parking. This is why you have to ask Alexa how to pay your parking ticket, because we have some of the most confused parking uh, signs in the country, I think. Uh, so we actually have an app that helps you understand, is it safe to park here <laughs> at this point on this day? Um, and then we also, it's a little confusing on how to find a job in the city, because we have all these archaic civil service testing exams. So we actually simplified the whole process, and that was another hack we did. So all of these are great ways that the community comes together to say, this is something that frustrates me. Let's fix it. And then from the city and county, we make sure we're there so that we adopt that and make sure it's usable. And then we also created, I created a data science federation. So I realized as a professor at UCLA that my students in data science and big data had a lot of trouble getting access to data. And I could point them to data.gov, 
but they wanted to work on like real problems. So I recruited 15 other universities, um, and now what we have is students come in every quarter, and we've had about 400 students come through the program so far. They work on city challenges. Uh, they get real data, resume builders. We've promised and commit to publishing their results. Um, and we do that using, we communicate using Slack, which is a really interesting chat capability. And then we publish on GitHub, which is a well-known open source uh, community. And that sort of gives them some online credentials when they're applying for jobs later. My total ulterior motive is to hire the most amazing data scientists into the city. So over the next three to four years, we are uh, in a deficit of about 10 to 12,000 city employees. We're hiring like mad. And so I want these kids who are going to school in LA and learning about the city to really then come and want to work for the city. Because I think once you get a taste of uh, public service, you really realize that how important the th work that you do can be. So we, um, each quarter we bring together city departments that have real challenges and maybe aren't thinking really differently about how to solve those. We partner them with really amazing, energetic, bright young kids and the professors, and then we do these great transformational projects. We are currently working on one around homelessness. We looked at all the issues and factors that sort of are the triggers that take people into homelessness. If you're a foster child, if you were a veteran, if you were sexually abused in the military as a veteran, if you don't have a social connection to a lot of people in Los Angeles, because if you have friends or family, you can stay with them if you become homeless, right? Um, so all of these factors are ones that we look at when somebody first comes in for a city service, and if you have a higher risk of then falling into homelessness, we try to give you extra support and services. So the idea is not just to take somebody who's been homeless on the streets, and get them housed, but to really take somebody before that happens to them, before that tragedy befalls them and their family, and help them with just a little bit of extra support and services to be able to stay where they are. And this is a group of kids I teach from UCLA. So these are some of my data scientists. Um, and you can see in the front the really sophisticated data. So we're, using, we're not using R, we're not using Esri Maps, we're using Legos. Um, because sometimes that's sort of the denominating factor that lets us all get together and put an idea. So these kids were looking at redesigning the park across the street. They come to the class with an idea for transforming their community. One of these kids uh, is homeless at this time. Later, he called me up and said that because of the class, he felt really empowered, and he got his first place a month later. And now a year later, Jesse is married and has a little boy, Bradley, super cute. Um, and, uh, and so some of my kids are coming out of gangs. Some of them are coming out of prison. Some of them are recovery programs. It's not your traditional UCLA class. My dean thought it was crazy when I first proposed it. But I waive my salary. We, he waives the fees. Everybody gets to go for free. And it's a great stepping stone for kids to really un start to understand the power of transformation in the community. We give them digital tools to do this, but it's really the power inside themselves that we try to unleash. As part of this, we really connect to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and make sure that the city of Los Angeles is part of the global movement to really make, yes, go SDGs, I'm wearing my SDG pin today, um, to understand the coherent conversations around things like poverty, hunger, health, Things we don't, we try to fix as a city, but we don't really talk about in a very straightforward way that really connects to everybody. And then we get to learn from other cities and countries. So what works in LA can sometimes work in Kampala, Uganda. What works in Accra, Ghana can also work in Shanghai. And so by sharing these together as a city, we really start to work on trying to do things like ending poverty, mitigating hunger, improving health, improving gender equity. And we hope to crescendo a lot of this work. The Sustainable Development Goals end in 2028, or 2030, but in 2028, we're getting the Olympics for the third time. It's super exciting. Um, and as part of this, I think the, the thing that Mayor Garcetti did that was the smartest is he said, okay, Paris wants 2024, we want 2024. Tell you what, we'll take 2028 and $110 million for our youth sports programs. <laughs> 
So they bought us off, the International Olympic Com Committee did, in order for us to be able to take that later date. And now with that $110 million, we are investing in the whole generation of Olympians that will be competing at those games. So it's really been transformational for all of our youth to be able to have these programs. And part of this is really then looking at the future of technology. And all of these different kinds of things we talked about, machine learning and computer vision, artificial intelligence, um, intelligent agents, all of these things are really transformational at the very specific level of a citizen working in the city of Los Angeles. And we work really very closely. The library is part and parcel with John Zabo and Susan Broman and all the great leadership at the LA Public Libraries for being part of this transformational effort at the individual level, making sure that everybody has access to these tools. Because we know that the future is really about giving people access to that information to empower them to make better decisions. Without that information, they're working in the blind. And we want everybody to be able to walk forward into a very bright future. And so all of you are the data scientists, the library scientists, the information technology professionals who are really the heroes in helping to make sure that every single citizen in all of your cities is connected and able to move into that future in a bright, forward-looking way. So thank you, all of you, for all of the work you do every day.